Hello everyone and welcome to the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It is the 20th of May. I hope you've been enjoying your newfound freedoms here in the UK as COVID restrictions have been lifted. And I hope that many of you have been uh, getting hold of your vaccinations. I got vaccinated with my first jab uh, this week. Um, slightly, I have to admit, slightly croaky and feeling the side effects over the last couple of days, but not too bad at all. So I hope everyone is generally well and happy. And thank you for joining for today, uh, the live Q&A with all of your fantastic questions um, that have been coming in as always. And we're going to get straight to it with a question from Annie Fitzgerald Robbins, um, who has been asking about loom weights. Ooh. Uh, now, her question is, do you think the design of loom weights was purely practical or was there an aesthetic element to it? So, Annie, I am presuming that you have some professional interest in a weaving here to be asking about loom weights. And for those of us who are not all uh, kind of up to date on our what our loom weight technology involves, these are in the ancient world could be kind of small just lumps of clay that were used and attached to the ends of threads that were being woven into a piece of material to ensure that the thread was taut while it was being weaved. Um, and uh, kind of so you would have a whole selection of threads running down off a off a kind of wooden frame and at the bottom each would have a loom weight on it roughly the same weight to keep everything under the same tension um, and then you would be able to uh, make sure that you could weave uh, with a taut cloth to make sure there were any gaps and problems with your weaving. Um, yes indeed thank you everyone hello nice to see you weather is absolutely awful it is indeed the wind is howling outside and uh, yesterday I drove through the most torrential lightning and rainstorm as well. No one quite knows what it uh, is doing here in the UK at the moment, very much living up to the good old adage of don't cast a clout till May is out. Loon weights or loom weights. Yes, thank you, Clive. Loon, there are no loons around here. We are dealing with loom weights only. Thank you very much indeed. Um, yeah, so loom weights. And uh, Annie's question is, were they purely practical? So were they just sort of lumps of, of, of clay or was there an aesthetic element to it? And Annie, you are absolutely right. Um, there was a very much an aesthetic element to it and the more we look into this the more we notice actually that loom weights seem to have been really quite an important part of both the domestic and the ritual sanctuary environment particularly for women. So uh, in terms of decoration what kind of decoration could loom weights have on them? Well sometimes it could be as simple as sort of incised lines and dots um, but we have lots of examples where things get a bit more complicated, sort of circular and oval strips. It's getting good. But it goes even further than that because it gets to the actual decoration and stamping of entire figures. So we'll see uh, things like um, flowers. Uh, we'll see um, pomegranates, other types of fruit, then figures like satyrs. So those kind of half goat, half male characters that kind of run around on Greek vases all the time that we're used to having a look at. But actually you see those stamped on loom weights as well. Um, and even, so this is my personal favourite, there's one from southern Italy that has survived, which has the tiny imprint of a foot on it, which I think is incredibly cute. Sometimes they're even shaped and then imprinted with design to look like the whole loom weight as a whole is a face. Um, and then you get the ones that we think were potentially used particularly in the ritual environment. So this might not have been a practical loom weight that you actually did any weaving with at all, um, but actually was something that was designed especially to then be dedicated by a woman within a religious sanctuary as an offering to the gods. Um, and there you get loom weights that are decorated with the images of particular gods. And that might be the image of a god or it might be the name of a god. Um, so kind of you've got an entire range here of loom weights um, that actually have a very, very practical purpose and could be very, very simple. But it clearly they were also something that people, if they could afford to, would like to invest time in or invest having uh, some made that have particular meaning, perhaps particular inside joke about the image that was on it, particular thing that they liked uh, very much and wanted to see it reflected in their household goods around them. And then actually as a something which is obviously personal and important and which is kind of very much associated with the world of the female within the house could be turned into an object specifically for uh, dedication to the gods. Um, so there you go. And who knew? 
Annie, uh, thank you for taking us on to loom weights. Absolutely brilliant, uh, kind of and fantastic. So now one can look around, I suspect, for loom weights and things that we, we kind of use on a day-to-day -day basis that when we realise that actually so much of what we have, we have in infected is probably too strong a word isn't it inflicted too harsh a word um has kind of picked up on our natural likes and dislikes and as a result is a reflection of ours uh in one way or another um kind of he kind of ah and zeus yes we'll be getting on to him in a second uh alexis and uh, tracy so yes hold your horses uh talking about zeus um because it's time to bring in deborah anderson's question and deborah Poor Deborah, when she was listening live last time, uh, was suffering with toothache. Deborah, I hope it's fixed now, poor thing. Uh, kind of, I hope you're feeling a lot, lot better. But anyway, as this is what I absolutely love about dedication to the cause of antiquity in the ancient world. You're channeling your suffering into asking a good, thoughtful question about antiquity. So you're currently suffering with toothache, or you were. What was the, this has made you think about what was the standard of dentistry in ancient times? Deborah tells us it's all better now. Thank God. Thank you, Deborah, for letting us know. But brilliant. Well done for kind of channeling your thoughts um, towards understanding a little bit something about the ancient world. So what about dentistry in the ancient world? Well, I have one word for you, Deborah. If you were still suffering from a toothache, I would tell you to call on St. Apollonia. Yes, uh, from the early Christian period, it's still in the, within the Roman world, so talking about that period when um, actually Christianity was not yet accepted by the Roman world as their official religion. And in fact, there was a great deal of um, kind of cr um, crucifixion of uh, early Christian uh, worshippers uh, and indeed particularly kind of hunting out um, of kind of Christian believers. And particularly in Alexandria in Egypt, this was a major place where this kind of tended to happen. And St. Apollonia was one of those early Christian would become a martyr, um, who had her teeth knocked out by the rabble and then were burnt and supposedly uh, kind of asked um, that uh, she be remembered as, as someone who could help people out in times of toothache. Um, so I think Apollonia is your uh, kind of person to call upon. But if you didn't have her, we can actually know quite a lot about what the ancients did with um, toothache, a kind of a common problem that has besieged us since time immemorial. Although it probably would have been different types of toothache because don't forget ancient diets would have been a lot less high on sugar and refined food. So probably a lot less tooth decay than we're used to now. Obviously, obviously standards of hygiene weren't as high. There were some versions of ancient toothpaste, but it's unclear if people kind of really um, use them on a regular basis. But actually it was probably more wear, or the wearing of teeth um, from eating much coarser foods that required a lot more grinding and mashing that would have caused the real trouble. Um, and so ancient Egyptians, they, if they had toothache, we think with, they wore amulets to ward off the evil of toothache that was being inflicted on them by some kind of god. Um, and then if we come into the Roman world, well, they thought a little bit of fumigation could help out here. So that sounds quite a kind of interesting sort of fumes, I suspect, that had a slightly kind of hallucinogenic effect to them that were sort of taking the edge off that toothache. So you could be fumed. And that might help. Um, but they also did extraction. There was absolutely extraction of teeth going on in antiquity. That was another great thing that the Romans got, got quite good at. Um, and even, if you can believe it, the making of dentures. Yeah, so the Romans happily um, made dentures of uh, kind of uh, fake teeth for you to then to put in your mouth to cover up the gaps where you'd lost your teeth. Although we're not very sure that these dentures were very well fitted. You can imagine the difficulty using uh, tools from 2000 years ago and wood and bone and other bits of material to try and f uh, fashion a denture and a fake tooth. And there's a famous story in ancient uh, literary sources of um, so-called sort of witch-like women, old women running down the street and their dentures just falling out of their mouths as they were jogging along. Um, so kind of perhaps not quite as well fitted as we might have hoped. Although the Etruscan before the Romans in Italy were said to um, surviving example shows that they were making dentures as well in very very nice uh, kind of bone uh, and gold so kind of a much nicer quality of Etruscan denture rather than Roman denture. 
And Lindus told us the ancient Mayans used some bark from a tree from a type of chewing gum as an alternative to toothpaste. Absolutely, kind of getting the saliva uh, kind of moving and helping clean up the mouth. And it's uh, kind of thought that there, there was a sort of indication that you, a sense or an understanding of oral hygiene in a way that you should wash out your mouth in the Roman world uh, as much as you can. Um, but uh, kind of certainly not uh, the brushing in morning and evening as we suggest today. But then of course they weren't affected with, as we said, our high sugar diet. So Deborah, absolutely absolutely fantastic question. I'm so glad to hear that your um, uh, toothache has passed and thank you um, for uh, telling us about it so that we could get into the mad, weird and wonderful world of ancient dentistry. Um, this is absolutely brilliant. Right, so we have time to go over to uh, Alexis Brown who has been asking some questions about um, ancient goddesses of Artemis and Athena. Um, now, uh, Alexis is interested in Artemis and Athena being described by many ancient writers as uh, virgin goddesses um, uh, but it actually, Alexis is asking about the ancient Greek terminology and whether it means necessarily virgin or simply unmarried well kind of oftentimes it's referred to as Parthenos in the ancient Greek so Athena Parthenos um, kind of for example the Parthenon uh, in Athens Athena Parthenos and that Parthenos does mean maiden or kind of young girl or young woman and specifically at that age unmarried but available to be, uh, but obviously kind of it is pretty much written into most of the myths about these two goddesses that they are uh, perennially kind of virgins and kind of that builds into their allure and character as not being mastered by, not having any kind of male master, um, but actually being powerful uh, in their own right and able to, as a result, exert influence over men. So you're absolutely right that it's not necessarily there in ancient Greek or there's rather ambiguity in kind of what the ancient Greek word is really talking about and referring to, but the way that myths have been talked about um, that kind of get, gets built in to the story. And Alexis is also asking about another kind of terminology word that's often associated with Athena, which is Athena glaucopis. Now, that's the ancient Greek word, and it refers to the quality of her eyes. Now, these words are what we know as epithets, so kind of they're descriptor words for gods and goddesses and heroes in the ancient Greek world. And glaucopis is sometimes translated as, as Alexis points out, grey-eyed, but actually probably more uh, kind of glistening, flashing, gleaming, something like that. Now, a couple of weeks ago, when we were talking about ancient colour, and I was telling you about my PhD student who's currently working on colour in the ancient Greek world, one of the, her chapters is actually on Glaucos as a as what it is, and what, what is it is a bigger question, because it's not uh, a colour as necessarily as we would define colours in the modern world. They didn't think about colour in quite the same way, or at least describe it in quite the same way as we do today, where we're sort of overwhelmed and kind of completely uh, sort of bought into the Newtonian colour wheel. And actually, the Greeks were much as interested as describing what we would think of as colour, um, in, but also in terms of describing lustre, so gleaming brilliance. So you can have something which is glaucos, um, when actually we would think of it as that that object being several completely different colours, but for the ancient Greeks that all of those objects could be glaucos. And again, Alexis, that's where we have a slight difficulty with the translation, because in translating glaucos or glaucopis in this case, we have to pick one word. We can't have it's this, stroke this, stroke this, stroke this um, in translation. So that is one of the internal difficulties with translation, is trying to work out a way of expressing the multitude of different possibilities that are sometimes uh, kind of all kind of packed into that one Greek word while still making it a usable and readable translation. Um, so thank you very much indeed, Alexis, for that question. Now, moving on briefly and quickly before we start to think about what's on around, uh, going on around the world to do with the ancient world right now, there is a great question from Rupert Thorpe. Now, Rupert's been asking about ancient art and ancient statues. And I thought for a moment that I knew the answer to this question, but then I realised that I didn't. Rupert, so you are asking not about the statues themselves, but about the painting of those statues. And you're not asking about kind of necessarily what colours they were painted, because you guys are all so well aware and brilliantly on top of the latest scholarly thinking that actually ancient Greek statues were um, very, very highly coloured, brightly coloured 
uh, painted off often. And some of you may have seen the incredible kind of reproductions that have been done, particularly of the sculptures from, say, the pediment of the Temple of the Fire at Egina, uh, in which Heracles is in, in a sort of, you know, all-in-one leotard in bright yellow, but actually looked at some of the temples that were painted in the ancient Greek world, bright red, bright blue, bright green, um, kind of, and, uh, and so we're, we're all well aware that actually ancient Greek statuary was, for the most part, kitsch in its bright coloredness. I mean, we literally have to put our sunglasses on. Um, and uh, obviously kind of a lot of the, the, the modern world struggles with that idea because we've grown up with the idea of being of classical as being all that white marble and defining kitsch as the antithesis of that. But actually we have to realize and accept the ancient Greek world was brightly colored. But that is not Rupert's question. Rupert's question is actually saying, do we know anything about the artists that painted these classical statues, all of these bright colours, or painted these temples, all of these bright colours. Do we know anything about them? And that is an absolutely brilliant question. Um, so in the ancient Greek world, actually until about mm, middle of the 5th century BCE, we are not really even sure of the many, many names of sculptors of ancient Greek statuary. Um, or indeed architects of designing buildings, um, let alone thinking about who painted it. Um, now, and it's only in the sort of middle of the fifth century we start to hear about people like Phidias, the guy who creates the statue of Zeus at Olympia. And when we get down to about 425 to 400 BC, so the end of the fifth century BC, we actually have a surviving inscription, again from Olympia, in which um, for a statue that's put up, it says dedicated um, by the Messenians and the now Pactians. Uh, and then underneath that, it says Paionios was the sculptor, the man who also won the competition to make the acriterion for the temple, the kind of top little um, statue bit for the top of the, the pedimental roof of the temple of presumably Zeus at Olympia as well. So that's one of the first times, end of the fifth century, where we get a, a, an actual inscription, an actual text attached to a statue going, this is the sculptor who sculpted it. But that doesn't tell us who might have painted it. And this got me really thinking as to, should we be expecting that it was the sculptor who then also turned their hand to painting it? Or was there a whole group of painters who then rocked up to paint these classical statues? Now, we know more about painters of vase painting. So we might think about the most famous of those, Exekias, also in 5th century Athens, very famous for um, painting vases. And these guys all hung out in Athens, at least, in an area of Athens called the Keramikos, the pottery quarter that was right next door to the sort of gates of the city and the city's graveyard, in fact. Um, and you could pop down there to get um, a more or a less expensive set of Greek um, symposium uh, cups and amphoras and wine jugs that had been painted by a more or less well-known painter. So did these guys perhaps turn their hands to then also doing a sideline in painting sculpture when they were needed to. On the other hand, we, we know something about wall painters in the ancient Greek world. So there are uh, names of so-called fa famous people who did wall paintings. Um, and we might go to Delphi for an example of this, where there was something called a lesca, which is a kind of leisure place that was set up within the sanctuary of Apollo at Delphi by the Canidians from Canidos over in Asia Minor, which they then paid not just for a, a building to be created, but for a very very, very well-known wall painter to come in and paint complex scenes all over the inside walls, which could then be leisurely taken in by the people who visited the building. And we know lots of detail about these wall paintings because Pausanias, who wrote about Delphi as well as lots of places around ancient Greece in the second century AD, came and described for us in detail. So we have wall painters who we know about, we have vase painters who we know about, but do we have any sculptor? painters um, specifically recorded as doing the sculptor, sculpt, painting of sculptures or the painting of temples. Now, I think the closest 
we perhaps could get, but I need to go and check this, is for the Eric Theon in Athens, where we have a sort of snag list from the building when it was left unfinished towards the end of the fifth century. And then we have a very, very, very detailed list of who's being paid to do what, down to the level of who's carving individual figures and who's fluting the columns. But I don't know whether that list actually then goes on to talk about anyone who's painting it. So, Rupert, you have asked an absolutely genius question. Um, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. This is going to require more research. If anyone out there is listening who has any indicators or any things that we can point us to that might have been written about the painters of ancient sculptures, if we know anything about them, do let us know. Here, this is a dot, 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 unfinished question moment that we're going to have to come back to, um, but absolutely brilliant. Right, in the news, what have we been looking at? Well, kind of, of course, um, Rome is opening the remains of a Roman villa that was hidden for 2,000 years on the Aventine Hill. So this villa has been buried for almost 2,000 years at the foot of the Rome's Aventine Hill, and it's going to be opening to visitors uh, from the 7th of May. Get in there the moment you can get to Rome. Um, in Down near Vesuvius, they think they've identified a Herculaneum, the skeleton of someone who might have been an actual rescuer. So this is very exciting. We're not actually knowing up until this point that people got to Herculaneum to help out the people who were struggling to run away from it, um, kind of is now thought this might have been, this guy might have been a senior officer in the rescue mission launched by Pliny the Elder to save people um, from Vesuvius. This is very exciting. Back in the UK, uh, in Cambridge, um, in, in one of the colleges, in Lucy Cavendish College, they've actually unearthed a Roman settlement, um, kind of including some human remains, kind of absolutely brilliant that we're seeing more uh, part of the kind of the, the wider Roman settlement that was in Cambridge, uh, kind of the bridge of Camford, the bridge across camp, the river camp. I look forward to hearing more about that. Many of you have been commenting on talk, keeping up the Cambridge theme here. Uh, Mary Beard's uh, decision to leave a fantastic fund when she retires uh, from her university post next year um, to help uh, uh, privileged, uh, underprivileged students from particularly um, different uh, ethnic backgrounds come to study classics. This is absolutely fantastic. We need more of this. Bravo, Mary. Um, from the art newspaper, Greece is planning to open up um, shipwrecks and other submerged heritage sites for visitors to explore. Now, I don't know if any of you are keen scuba divers. Um, I like to scuba dive on occasion. Um, I would love to get into, uh, go and see these shipwrecks, see these places in situ. That'd be absolutely fabulous, but I can't imagine the headache it would be trying to uh, police, police the tourism um, of people diving to see all these shipwreck sites, but we can't wait to see how they work it out. Um, in southern Spain, it's getting a very, oh, we just want to be able to go to all these places, don't we? In southern Spain, Spain, a Roman bath has emerged from the sand dunes um, of the emblematic Trafalgar Cape in southwest Spain. Uh, they kind of, it's a completely surprised archaeologists at the University of Cadiz, as well as locals, who've walked for years across the dunes, oblivious of the relics that were below them. Isn't that? It's absolutely extraordinary. Uh, kind of, you never ever know what was in, uh, what is underneath your feet. Yes, Antonius, yes, we were in Bayer scuba diving there at the great archaeological, underwater archaeological site in Italy at Bayer when we were filming there a couple of years ago. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and then what's on? What's coming up around the world? Well, uh, as one of you mentioned earlier on, thank you so much for buying a ticket. 8th of June, I'm going to be talking for Classics for All um, and an online event called Remembering and Forgetting the Past Athens in 403 BCE. So if you are able to come along from 6 to 7 p.m. Uh, on the 8th of June, do sign up for a ticket for that. That'd be absolutely brilliant. Um, and it'd be lovely to see you there. Uh, then also Dr. Simon Elliott and Dr. Ian Betts, you're probably familiar with, again, via Zoom, coming up uh, on the 27th of May, so before... Uh, uh, my event for Classics for All, talking about constructing Londinium, uh, and that's going to be online via Zoom as well. So do cut, uh, tune in for that if you can. And then, of course, the new historical sky drama, Domina. Who's been watching this? What do people think? Uh, let us know your thoughts about whether you've been enjoying this, uh, kind of going at it, uh, kind of the, the the power, well, kind of how are they they're selling it as the powers behind the power, i.e. it's the story of kind of particularly the wife of of Augustus, Livia, um, and uh, kind of her rag to riches story to becoming kind of one of the most powerful and certainly one of the most influential women of the ancient world. 
So do uh, check in with that and let us know what you think about it. Um, Roman eye care. We've talked about teeth today, so we should talk about eyes as well. History Hit has a podcast at the moment, The Ancients, Windows to the Soul, Roman Eye Care. Dr. Nick Summerton is a practicing do- doctor and author of Greco Roman Medicine and what it can teach us today. Kind of uh, do have a listen to that. That History Hit podcast, absolutely brilliant. Uh, there's also a History Hit podcast out there about the golden age. There may be. We can let you in on a little secret now. A new podcast coming up uh, from me with the team of History Hack um, that might be on the subject of Heracles. Don't tell anyone yet. We'll let you know the link uh, when it is ready to go. Um, Natalie Haynes is also doing a Stand Up for the Classics news series talking about Medusa. So do get in and watch that. And Time Team is coming back. Having been crowdfunded Time Team is coming back, yes, with two new digs happening through this summer that will then be streamed through their YouTube channel. So absolutely brilliant stuff all around. We've got time for just another question or two. Um, Eliana Psiaki has asked about, have you ever attended a performance at the Athens or Epidaphros Festival as it's starting off again this summer? Yay! Kind of, well, I have never been able to go, no, I have never had the chance to go to the Epidaphros Theatrical Festival. I would love to sit in the Theatre at Epidavros and watch an ancient Greek tragedy and performance in the spot where they were doing just that two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, I would love to do that. I have had the chance to go in Athens to the Theatre of Herodes Atticus, um, where modern performances are also staged in the summer. So that's the Roman era theatre built into the side of the Acropolis um, by the very, very rich friend of the Roman Emperor at the time, Herodes Atticus. Um, and that we saw two performances there. One was actually the uh, National Ballet, the English, uh, English National National Ballet uh, performing uh, on a stage that had been set up over the ancient Roman and uh, Roman Greek Roman stage, which was amazing. And before that, I also saw a performance of Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream. So I haven't yet seen an actual ancient Greek tragedy in this theatre uh, of Athens, but uh, have managed to see a couple of other different things. So, Eliana, thank you very much. What have you guys seen? Are you going to get there this summer? If you do, send us some photos. Please send us some photos of the festival at Epidavros. Um, and uh, kind of here we go. We're going to leave you with a question from Linda Montague. That's one for you guys to answer over the course of the week. Send in your thoughts to the Facebook page and we'll put some thoughts together and share them all with you next week. Linda's saying uh, she's been thinking about one of her favourite films, uh, Le Visiteur, and wondering how an ancient Greek or Roman would get on if they appeared in one of our cities today. Right? Uh, in particular, the domestic side of life today. So here is your question for you to think about while uh, you are taking, uh, uh, relaxing over the weekend, perhaps this weekend. Um, do send your thoughts into the Facebook page or via email to michaelscottacademic at gmail.com and we'll put forward some of your suggestions at the Q&A next time. Um, so thinking of your favourite film, what would an ancient Greek or Roman, how would they get on? if they appeared in one of our cities today and had to survive and negotiate their way through a city um, of the modern world. What would happen? What would happen? Um, I'm trying to think kind of what would an ancient Greek do? What would Socrates do if they turned up in, uh, well, where I'm based in Oxford, uh, I suspect they'd be quite happy. They'd probably see their name and there's a Socrates Road, Socrates Avenue somewhere in Oxford. So they'd be pretty happy to have a, a, a road named after them. I think seeing all the students studying away vociferously, talking deeply and philosophically about the great issues of the day, I think he'd probably get on quite well. Um, I think he'd be a bit confused by the cyclists and the one-way systems. Um, possibly kind of he'd be at home with all the takeout food. Um, I think that would work pretty well, but uh, he he might get pr- very confused when he saw the ice rink. I think that might really fox him. Um, so do send your thoughts in, everyone, um, for that. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm sorry we haven't had a chance to get to your great questions that have come in, but they are on the list for next time, uh, and we will kind of come to them indeed. And when is next time? Next time is going to be in a couple of weeks, Thursday the 10th of June at 5pm. So pop it in your diaries. I hope you can join us then. Thursday the 10th of June, 5pm. I'll be here, and I look forward to seeing you then as well. In the meantime, take care. Stay safe. Bye.